Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Faculty of Humanities and Education's seventh annual distinguished lecture. I am Dr. Stanley Griffin, Deputy Dean for Undergraduate Studies in the Humanities, and I am pleased to moderate this afternoon's gathering. I want to thank each of you for joining this live stream and to gratefully acknowledge the presence of our Dean of the Faculty, Professor Sylvia Cohenberg, colleague Deputy Deans, Heads of Departments, Directors of Schools and Institutes, or Professors and Lecturers, Administrative and Supportive Staff, and especially our students and our wider university community. This afternoon, we gather as a faculty for, in a very dynamic sort of way, thanks to the pandemic, we're not necessarily meeting in our traditional lecture theater, but in this much wider forum. Our Faculty of Humanities and Education is a dynamic consortium of creative, innovative, thought provocative, and pragmatic disciplines covering the widest gamut of human activity, teaching and learning and expressions with a focus on the Caribbean's lived experiences. From creative writing to archaeology, music and the performing arts to foreign languages, information studies and sign language interpretation, cultural and creative industries to librarianship and linguistics, from education and philosophy to history and heritage studies, this faculty celebrates and reflects the unique, the unique articulations of Caribbean humanity in all its forms, and thirdly, for this distinguished lecture to consider new expressions, dynamics, and considerations that are shaping human thought and behavior the world over, and especially in our Caribbean region. Over the last few years, in this lecture series, we've considered the impact of history and journalism in the creation and dissemination of information, digital literacies and robotic futures, adding art to the educational stem of things, and Jamaican music at home and abroad. This afternoon, we gather yet again as a learning community under the distinct tutelage of our featured lecturer to reflect on the digital humanities, that academic area which for many of us is still shrouded in deep mystery as the digital environment itself. We are grateful to the Department of Literatures in English for recommending this afternoon's theme. As we explore teaching from the digital Black Atlantic, please be sure to engage with us, ask your questions, share your thoughts. Deputy Dean Nicole Plummer and Dr. Isis Samaj Hall are our live stream moderators this afternoon and are eager to ensure your full participation. So please feel free to engage. It is my pleasure to invite our Dean of the Faculty, Professor Sylvia Coenberg, to bring greetings. Thank you, Dean. Thank you, Deputy Dean, Dr. Stanley Griffin, for your stimulating opening remarks. I am here to welcome, on behalf of the Faculty of Humanities and Education, all members of university management, other colleagues, both academic and administrative staff, students, and members of the public at our seventh annual Distinguished Lecture. I especially welcome our distinguished speaker, Professor Rupi Kaurisam. Dean Wibinte Waribok, the previous dean, mooted the idea of an annual distinguished lecture for the faculty at a board meeting in October 2015. He made an explicit connection between the new lecture series and the development of innovative new taught programs, as well as the fostering of the faculty's research culture. In 2016, the focus of our first annual distinguished lecture was on the cultural and creative industries. Over the intervening years, these lectures have addressed topics already named by the Dean, such as digital literacies, STEM education, the intersection between history and journalism, and Jamaican music. Overall, we can say that lectures have focused on technology on one hand and the creative arts on the other, highlighting different aspects of this faculty's business. A happy marriage, which we continue. 
several of our annual distinguished lectures have been themed around the development of new programs as was the previous Dean's intention, specifically the BA programs, cultural and creative industries, history and journalism, and music and performance management. They have also been themed around the strengthening of existing programs in areas such as digital media production and STEM education. This is another tradition which we continue in today's lecture, as we will no doubt derive inspiration from it to further the development of a digital humanities program, an aspiration which goes back at least to 2018 and which we hope will become a reality in the coming year. In recent times, we have moved from a physical lecture format to an online format, a change which was forced upon us by the SARS-CoV-19 induced pandemic. In fact, the 2020 lecture was postponed by a year because of it. So last year we hosted both the 2020 and 2021 distinguished lectures. In retrospect, this format has been so beneficial that even if we return to the physical space, we will want to continue live streaming and the production, the professional production of videos which record these lectures and make them available as a source of inspirational ideas for the years to come. Our presenters have hailed from home and abroad. Three have been distinguished colleagues from within the Faculty of Humanities and Education. Three more have been distinguished colleagues from elsewhere. In all instances, though, our presenters have had strong connections with the business of this faculty. I note that today's speaker identifies as public scholar and digital humanist, as well as going by the more traditional scholarly label of associate professor of secondary and higher education and English. As a public scholar and digital humanist, I know we share the commitment to education as a source for good, not only for the individuals who partake in it and benefit from it, but especially for the inclusive development of the societies in which we operate. This, after all, is the University of the West Indies and therefore our mandate. I really look forward to today's annual distinguished lecture. Once again, I welcome Professor Rupika Rissam and all who are present to hear her presentation on teaching from the digital Black Atlantic. Chair, over to you. Thank you, Dean. We are so happy to have Dr. Aisha Spencer, the acting head of the Department of Literatures in English, and the pleasure is hers to introduce our distinguished lecturer. Thank you, Dr. Griffin. In an age where access to literature and growth in the area of literary studies has now become more possible through the strategic use of digital archives and has also become more sustainable through the use of open libraries, a variety of digital tools and different, different digital resources for pedagogical use in classroom spaces. Engagement with the topic of digital humanities has to be seen as pivotal, relevant, and necessary. As of the late 1980s, canonical literary texts, which may have become invisible or hard to find as printed books, have slowly been brought back to life through the process of digitization. The study of the literary text now comes alive to a more technologically advanced generation of students through the use of animation, film, or virtual maps used to explore locations in a literary text. It is this same process of digitization which also gave rise to the presence of hypertext fiction. Additionally, different digital media forms such as video games and animes can now be considered in discussions of what might characterize the literary arena. Now the literary work meets us where we are through iPads, tablets, and the Kindle app, leading to both diversity in and expansion of reading populations globally. It is because of the exciting and dynamic possibilities we can engage with through the experience of digital humanities that the Department of Literatures in English is proud to be associated with the selection of today's speaker for the seventh annual distinguished lecture in the Faculty of Humanities and Education, Professor Rupika Risam. Professor Rupika Risam is Associate Professor of Education and English at Salem State University, Chair of Secondary and Higher Education, author of New Digital Words, 
post-colonial digital humanities in theory, praxis, and pedagogy, and co-editor of the Digital Black Atlantic. Professor Reesom's scholarly work has focused on the intersections of post-colonial and African diaspora studies and digital humanities. She also co-edits the journal reviews in digital humanities, which offers peer reviews of digital scholarly output, outputs. Professor Reesom is also the principal investigator of the Digital Ethnic Futures Consortium, an initiative supported by the Mellon Foundation, which aims to build capacity for teaching on the intersections of digital humanities and ethnic studies. Her current book project is entitled Insurgent Academics, a radical account of public humanities, which traces a new history of public humanities through the emergence of ethnic studies. I now invite Professor Risam to offer the seventh distinguished lecture for the Faculty of Humanities and Education entitled Teaching from the Digital Black Atlantic. Thank you so much, Dr. Spencer, and thank you as well to Dr. Samaj Hall for bringing me to all of you today. I really wish that I were able to be there in person with all of you, but I am very grateful to be with you virtually instead. So in my talk today, teaching from the Digital Black Atlantic, I'm going to discuss how my colleague Kelly Baker Josephs and I conceptualized the Digital Black Atlantic as a concept for bringing together digital humanity scholarship and teaching in the African diaspora. And we'll talk through some of its implications for teaching, how it relates to some of my other projects, and some examples we can look to for integrating digital humanities into the teaching of African diaspora studies. Now the joke among digital humanities practitioners is that we're constantly having to define digital humanities. And I was actually recently at a relative's funeral and someone actually came up to me and said, so what is this digital humanities that you're always talking about? So for our purposes here, as I broadly understand it, digital humanities includes using digital and computational tools. So that could be digital mapping, quantitative textual analysis, network analysis, digital archives, digital exhibits, to understand literature, history, and culture. And also using the humanistic lenses such as Marxist thought or critical race theory or queer theory, for example, to analyze digital media platforms, objects, and cultures. My own work has been largely animated by the twin specters of, of hope in what digital humanities makes possible and deep concern that if we are not attending very carefully to how we undertake digital humanities scholarship, how we're producing digital archives, how we're producing digital exhibits, then we're going to foreclose the possibilities. Digital humanities is filled with rich but unrealized potential to democratize knowledge production. And I take these issues up in my first book, New Digital Worlds, Post-Colonial Digital Humanities and Theory Praxis and pedagogy, where I argue that humanity scholars are at a critical juncture where we have the opportunity to mobilize our scholarship, to disrupt the legacies of colonialism, racism, um, misogyny, class, sexuality, xenophobia, and other isms, if you will, within humanities knowledge production. And my work is grounded in the belief that digital humanities holds tremendous but crucially unrealized promise for such social change. In your digital worlds, I examine these ideas in the context of ongoing efforts to create a digital cultural record of humanity. Humanities knowledge production in mediated digital forms, which are translating for our 
print cultural record or material cultural record into a digital form continues to be marshaled to the exclusion of marginalized communities, whether it's because of race, gender, sexuality, migration, diaspora, or a combination of all of these factors. So at the most basic level, we need to re-examine and teach our students how to re-examine humanities research practices and challenge the ways that the exclusions and the biases that have characterized material culture and cultural heritage, which we know are products of racism, colonialism, and patriarchy, are not only being reproduced, but are also being amplified as digital knowledge production has accelerated rapidly in the last several decades. And this is really critical because as Scott publics are looking primarily to digital sources for information, humanities scholars have a responsibility to ensure that what those publics find are not only narratives that reproduce the canons that determine whose cultural productions are worth preserving, worth turning into digital archives and other digital forms, they must also find the narratives that shed light on the voices that have for too long gone unheard. And we can do this through our teaching by introducing our students to the power dynamics that shape digital knowledge production and creating opportunities for them to intervene in it. In the context of the African diaspora, these exclusions in the digital cultural record obscure histories of colonialism, racism, and slavery, as well as the way that Black communities have embraced digital technology as a means of survival, thriving, and joy. These are key topics that Dr. Josephs and I wanted to address in our edited collection, The Digital Black Atlantic, which was published in 2021 in the Debates in the Digital Humanities series at the University of Minnesota Press. And it's also available free in open access form from the press. And this is what our open access edition looks like. Through our editing process, we are claiming space for a digital Black Atlantic to honor the work that has already been done at the intersections of African diaspora studies and digital humanities and to assemble a citable body of work, which we argue is necessary for the scholarly legitimacy of this area of study and to grow the academic conversation and give us something to teach so that we can introduce these ideas to our students. Our work on the volume began in 20. 16, when Dr. Josephs and I were both approached by the same publisher at Routledge who was looking for books in a, in a series, and we ended up reaching out to each other and talking about what a volume on the African diaspora and digital humanities would look like. And then we ended up going to University of Minnesota Press to the Debates in the Digital Humanities series precisely because it was open access. And so we knew there'd be a print volume, but we also knew there would be a volume that anybody could read anywhere around the world. And that was really important to us because we wanted it accessible to scholars and students of the African diaspora, whether or not they could afford it or their libraries could afford it. For the Digital Black Atlantic, which we conceptualize as the body of interdisciplinary scholarship that examines connections between African diasporic communities and technology, there aren't any distinguished starting points. There are only what we call many beginnings that reflect the roots and routes of the African diaspora over many centuries. When Paul Gilroy published The Black Atlantic in 1993, he effected a seismological shift in Black studies, creating space and language for conceptualizing Blackness across the Americas, the Caribbean, Britain, Europe, and Africa. The concept of the Black Atlantic augurs a move beyond national borders that so often define knowledge production and towards an emphasis on Black diasporic connections. It also delinks African diasporic knowledge production from the intellectual heritage of the West in favor of connections among African diasporic communities of practice. 
As many scholars of the African diaspora have already noted, Black communities have been intimately familiar with technologies, both repressive and emancipatory, whether the ship, musical instruments, games, social media, or algorithms. The most frequently told stories of the African diaspora are those of technologies being used against Black people globally. But there are histories of African diasporic communities building on their familiarity with technology to appropriate it and to use it to their advantage. So we wanted to not have this simply be about technology as a form of repression, but also technology as a form of liberation. The essays in the volume demonstrate that there have been so many different terms that have been used to try and conceptualize the ways that broadly black studies and digital studies intersect with each other. So you may have heard of e-black studies, black code studies, black digital humanities, and then related terms, post-colonial digital humanities, the Caribbean digital, African digital humanities, digital diaspora, and more. But when we were thinking about the discussions that we wanted to foster in this volume, we thought about Gilroy's work and we wanted to evoke digital Black Atlantic as an inclusive term that encompassed the complex relations within and amongst these terms and the geographic positionality of African diaspora communities while also emphasizing the necessary interdisciplinarity of the scholarship that is, that is produced. Uh, so a primary goal of the volume is to consider what Black Atlantic as a formulation offers the study of Blackness in digital cultures while articulating the challenges that a Black Atlantic approach offers to digital humanities. The primary affordances of the digital Black Atlantic in this vein are many, and here are just a few. So a method for incorporating and foregrounding transnationality and cross-temporality. A framework for addressing these concerns in relation to race, slavery, and colonialism. A challenge to the European periodization of history and of culture a decentering of whiteness, a crit critique of this idea that there is anything universal about digital humanities, and an articulation of the necessity of interdisciplinary work. Many of these reflect the similar moves I was making in New Digital Worlds, as well as the ideas I strive to teach my own students. Scholarship and teaching on the African diaspora is inextricably linked to connections between literary and cultural texts, history, economics, sociology, and other disciplines by virtue of the influence of slavery and colonialism on African diasporic communities. There's a similar dynamic at work in digital and computational approaches to the African diaspora. In the space where digital and humanities and blackness and technology meet, the digital black Atlantic pushes back against the ways that technologies have historically been and continue to be used to disempower black communities and also against the dominance of such narratives. In order to emphasize instead how black peoples have taken advantage of affordances of technology to assert their humanity histories, knowledges, and expertise. A Black Atlantic perspective on the digital opens up possibilities of a model for incorporating underrepresented voices and histories within the digital humanities while resisting colonizing them as digital humanities has a tendency to do. So the Digital Black Atlantic is the first volume to put into conversation a cross-section of Black studies and digital studies often siloed by disciplinary or geographical or regional divisions, particularly divisions between African-American digital humanities, African digital humanities, and Caribbean digital humanities. 
while recognizing the importance of nurturing and continuing to grow those individual areas of scholarship, the Digital Black Atlantic also asks the salient question of what kinds of possibilities are opened up by putting these approaches in conversation with each other, especially given the relevant debates about Black digital studies that are emerging via local practices in each of these areas. So together, the contributions presented in the volume identify what a diaspora-based approach to digital humanities can look like. Through this work of curation and collation, the collection articulates a range of African diaspora approaches to digital humanities through a broad geographical scope. We have scholarship on work in Nigeria, Canada, Dominica, South Africa, United States, and yes, Jamaica. In doing so, the collection reveals the interdisciplinary breadth of digital studies in the African diaspora, including scholarship for musicology, game studies, history, literature, library and information studies, as well as multiple methodological approaches to these areas of scholarship. So community archives, library collection development, textual analysis, social network analysis, archive management, critical digital editing, video games, social media, and of course, teaching. In doing so, the Digital Black Atlantic demonstrates the importance of cultivating local digital humanities practices grounded in the history, present, and futures of the African diaspora. As such, we organize the volumes chapters into four sections that reflect these conceptual Black Atlantic concerns, their memory, crossings, relations, and becomings. Because this is the first edited volume on the topic, we believe that the form and the structure of the volume itself participates in the work of defining and creating um, space for scholarly interventions in the Black Atlantic. So we selected thematic divisions that resonated with Black Atlantic studies rather than having a section on theory, a section on practice, a section on pedagogy, which our reviewers sort of wanted us to do, but we pushed back and said, no, we found that those categorical divisions, particularly between research and teaching are artificial ones, considering how the theoretical, the practical, and the pedagogical are often intertwined in the work that we do. So our opening section on memory situates the histories of and contemporary archival impulses towards African diasporic experiences. Our next section called crossings encompasses the fluid and flexible ways that Black Atlantic digital humanities negotiates movement across time and space, forging varied spatial and temporal relationships. Inspired by Edouard Glissant's complex conception of networked creolized cultures, the section on relations reveals the rhizomatic connections created via exchanges across Black Atlantic spaces, both the digital and analog. And then finally in the section becomings, we outline the dreams and aspirations of the digital Black Atlantic as scholars continue to create and to imagine new configurations for the African diaspora in the digital cultural record. So because both Dr. Josephs, my co-editor, and I work at universities that are primarily teaching oriented, how the volume and our work together more generally could enhance teaching and pedagogy has very much been on our minds. And so this has uh, led to our work on keywords in Caribbean studies, which I will show you in a second. Um, now, you might hear in the description of the organization of the volume 
uh, echoes of the move towards key words as an organizing method in the humanities. Uh, it goes back to Raymond Williams's work um, from the from cultural studies, but has in probably the last 10 to 15 years, we've seen a lot more books, keywords in American studies, keywords in disability studies. So we're thinking about this keywords approach, which is also exemplified in the public recent publication. This is also open access and freely available from the Modern Language Association called Digital Pedagogy in the Humanities. And this is a keywords project for digital pedagogies, teaching with technology, and that includes curated collections of syllabi, classroom assignments, class projects that are all organized around themes. So if you're thinking about bringing digital humanities into your classroom, this is a really wonderful resource and it's freely available. I wrote the entry on intersectionality, you know, to intersectional feminism for it. And so it's a great way of looking for ideas. So as we were drawing on the inspiration of this volume, of our volume on the Digital Black Atlantic, of this volume you're looking at right now, the Digital Pedagogy and the Humanities, we were thinking about how can we help instructors in Caribbean studies make meaningful use of the wealth of digital resources that are available to teach in Caribbean studies. Uh, you know, from the Digital Library of the Caribbean to digitized journals, there's so much material out there, it's almost overwhelming. So how could we make that more navigable or more manageable? So Dr. Josephs and I developed keywords for Caribbean studies uh, to try and and make those resources more visible and to highlight them. So right now the study is organized around 10 keywords that we see as being integral to Caribbean studies. And we're absolutely open to ideas for more keywords if people who want to edit or curate new collections to add to this. For each keyword, a scholar drafts a short curatorial statement explaining the major themes and topics in Caribbean studies as they relate to this key word. Uh, and these curatorial notes are themselves just beautiful pieces of scholarship. And in addition, they select and write annotations for 10 digital resources that one could teach under that topic. So that it's a very useful resource for teaching, um, looking for materials to teach under particular themes. My work with Dr. Uh, Josephs, along with other colleagues working in Black um, diaspora studies, led to the creation of the Digital Ethnic Futures Consortium which brings together faculty across ethnic studies fields and digital humanities to think about our teaching. So all of the my co principal investigators on digital ethnic futures consortium or as we call it DEFCON, they were all writers of chapters in the digital black Atlantic so in, in a way. It really grew out of some of the collaborations that we forged through the, the digital black Atlantic volume. So. We host a speaker series, a virtual annual meeting. It's taking place on May 13th of this year. Um, we have opportunities for mentoring and curriculum development. So if you're interested in looking for a community to connect to uh, in, this, in this area of teaching, I encourage you to visit our site and to join us. Another useful resource when thinking about teaching with digital humanities is the journal that I co-edit with Jennifer Giuliano uh, called Reviews in Digital Humanities. So Reviews in DH is a journal that offers peer review of digital humanities projects. So one of the gaps in the process of academic peer review is how to evaluate a digital project, whether it's an exhibit or an archive or data visualizations or a digital edition. So 
we wanted to change that. And so we created this journal, which asks project creators to write a 500 word overview of their project. And then we send the overview along with the link to the project or any related documentation to a reviewer who then writes a 500 word review. And then we publish the overview and the review together. So the overview gives some insight on how the project was developed and why, and then the review assesses it. Because of my and Dr. Giuliano's backgrounds, we were particularly committed to featuring projects in African diaspora studies and also projects that involve teaching or have been used in classrooms or were created with students. So this has been a great place for people to find ideas. So for example, we published a review of the Caribbean Diaspora Project from you know, University of Puerto Rico. This is a really exciting project on Carnival. Uh, we published, this is a project Islands in the North, um, which is a, a map of Black Caribbean immigration to Toronto. It's just an exciting project. Um, and then undisciplining the Victorian classroom is a really interesting project because it gives some ideas for teaching Victorian studies in new ways. And one of the ways is by centering the Caribbean. And so, um, you know, we have found that people are using this journal as a way to find projects. Um, so people will either will assign the journal on their on their syllabi uh, to, you know, show people where, um, you know, where you can look at projects. Um, we have had a special issue on digital pedagogies, which the projects are all projects that were either undertaken by students uh, or either in the context of a class or independently by students having been inspired by work in a class. It's really wonderful to see what our colleagues are doing. One of the guest editors of this issue is Shyla Esprit, who's been doing really wonderful work with Create Caribbean. Um, and we're a huge um, fan of, of Shyla, uh, Shyla's work. Um, our project registry has been a resource for teaching. So we have opportunities to search for all the projects we've reviewed. Now it's we're almost up to having reviewed 100 projects since we first started in January of 2020. So um, this is the topic for African diaspora studies. So you can search by topic, time period, as well as by method. Um, in our education and our curriculum and pedagogy, um, sections we have a bunch of projects that were taken undertaken as classroom projects um, as well um, so it's a really good way to get some ideas of digital humanities projects you could do with students we've also seen colleagues assigning our review process as a classroom assignment to have students study and learn about a project and do a review of it and one step further, we had a colleague actually do a special issue of the journal with her class. So she was the guest editor. The students reviewed the projects and we worked with them to publish a three part issue called Reviews in the Classroom. And that was with Tanya Clement at UT Austin, University of Texas, Austin. So it was a really wonderful um, collaboration. So I showed you those because I wanted to sort of speak to some of the work that I've done that has been aimed at helping instructors. Uh, think through how to incorporate digital humanities into their teaching. Um, but I'd also like to talk a little bit about how my own teaching has been guided by a commitment to improving representation of digital scholarship for the Black diaspora. So I'm going to speak to a few examples. At Salem State University, where I work, we developed an undergraduate research program called the Digital Scholars Program to give our humanities students opportunities to learn about working with cultural heritage data. So we didn't we don't have a lot of research opportunities for our students. We have a very small honors program that could be filled with way more students than we have space for in the honors program. So if you're not in that program, you don't really get the opportunity to do mentored independent research with a faculty member. So we thought, you know, digital humanities would be a nice way to give students those opportunities. 
Now at Salem State, we don't have many financial resources. We are a public university, but we're not an elite public university. So we don't have a lot of money. So we have really embraced the possibilities of low tech approaches to diversifying the digital cultural record and teaching our students that it's important to give voice to the ordinary, to the everyday, and to shed light on the hidden histories that shape where we are in Salem, Massachusetts today, using freely available and open source digital tools that are easy for our students to learn how to use. So we're not working with large collections or big data. We're working with small, unprocessed, often unprocessed collections in our university archives. And, you know, they come to us often curated by local history buffs and hobbyists who've just collected photos or collected documents and then give them to us. So um, our students are creating very small scale projects that they can create in the span of a semester or a year. And here is one example. It's called A Change Will Come, in which uh, students went through our archives and special collections at the university, including our student newspaper and various student groups like the Afro-American Society and the Black Caucus from the 1960s and 1970s. And they identified documents that spoke to Black history at our university. And they transcribed the documents and then they put together this timeline, which you can see here, um, that speaks to the history of campus activism for an African American studies minor, African American studies major, and more Black professors. Right now, like most universe, many universities in the US, our Black students have been working together and forming groups to demand a curriculum that reflects their experiences and more Black professors and professors of color. And so our students were able to see that their activism today is part of a longer history. Um, it's actually sad to say that the demands are still the same today, and they very much recognize that. So they use this project at events to make the point to our administration that the very same demands that they are making now are the same demands that our students are making in the 1960s and the 1970s and that not a lot has changed. In this case, the timeline was built in Tiki Taki, which is a relatively easy um, browser-based tool for developing a timeline. This is the 3D version of it. There's also a two-dimensional version of it. Um, we also have been encouraging our students to use Timeline JS which is a really easy to use timeline builder because students just have to enter dates and links to images or text for an annotation on a timeline into a Google spreadsheet, a Google sheet. And it's a special Google sheet that has a script embedded in it that will turn it into a timeline by entering a few pieces of information on the timeline JS website. <coughs> Excuse me. So um, it's a very attractive uh, tool for teaching because all students have to be able to do is enter information into a Google Sheet. There's not really a lot of specialized knowledge that they need to make it. I've also worked with students um, to use mapping and data approaches to explore the history of Pan-Africanism which has introduced them to both data work and archival research. Several questions have guided this work. If we were to undertake archival and secondary source research, could we identify participants in Pan-Africanist movements during the first half of the 20th century? And what kinds of connections between participants might we find? Might we find that there are recurrent figures attending these events who aren't the major figures we associate with Pan-Africanism like W.E.B. Du Bois or Kwame Nkrumah or Marcus Garvey. So we developed a series of data sets that are freely and openly available to anybody who wants to download them and reuse them, where we tried to source the lists 
of participants in both well-known events like the Pan-African Congresses, as well as lesser known events that we, uh, for which we could find records. Uh, so these data sets include names of participants, they include if we have occupational information, they include citations to the secondary or primary sources where we found these participants. Um, what's actually really interesting is for a lot of these events, we we're able to find the total number of participants who in published in sources like newspapers. And so that gave us some sense of how many of the participants we had actually been able to find versus how many had been there. And in the case of some of these events, we have really, really good lists actually. Um, now, the results confirmed that the most frequent attendees were the people we already know are most closely associated with Pan-Africanism, which is perhaps to be expected because they, people like Du Bois would have had access to um, funds and resources to attend. Uh, he was the person who had attended the most of these events. Uh, he had the highest number of, uh, of attendance at events. And then most people attended one event generally because it took place near where they lived. Uh, but that shows how it was an opportunity to talk to students about several things, right? One, that sometimes you start a project with a hypothesis and it doesn't pan out. And that doesn't mean you failed and that doesn't mean it's the end of everything, but instead it's an opportunity to think creatively about what other kinds of insights might emerge from your work. Um, the other uh, piece of this uh, is that um, we weren't anticipating uh, that uh, there was such a broader geographical reach of Pan-Africanism than we had expected. So what we had to pivot from our failed attempt at creating a network data visualization, which really looked like a giant messy hairball or ball of wool, it was completely not helpful. We decided to map the uh, participants. And this is a, a map um, that is color coded based on numbers of participants. So. Um, the lightest yellow are the places with the lowest number of participants and then red is where we have the highest number of participants and so we didn't anticipate strong participation of canadians indians chinese people in pan-africanist events so but it clearly there's a geographical reach for pan-africanism that exceeded um, then colonies in africa uh, and countries that we associate with more sizable diasporic um, populations. Um, so this data visual, this mapping visualization was created in Tableau. Tableau is a data visualization tool. It's not, it's a little bit, it, there's a little bit of a learning curve to figure out how to run it, but it is free for anybody who's a teacher and anybody who's a student. So it's a really great tool to teach with. Um, and there's also a really strong community of users for it, particularly for teaching. So there's a lot of tutorials, there's a lot of resources to help uh, work with this. And really all you need is a data set in a, what's called a um, CSV or comma separated values file, which you can put data into a spreadsheet, whether a Google sheet or Excel and save it as this .csv file and boom, you press two buttons and it, it loads it in the tableau for you. It's very, very useful. Uh, we also, I wanted to avoid animations because of bandwidth issues, but you can also animate a map and show, you know, the spread. We have a map showing the spread of Pan-Africanism um, over, over time using our data sets. Finally, another mapping project that I've worked on with students is the Cultural Atlas of Global Blackness, uh, which grew out of a series of literature courses on the Black radical tradition. And I was smiling when Dr. Spencer was talking about mapping literary locations because I realized I would be talking about that. And um, so this is a, a map that I developed over a series of courses with students 
um, in which they were mapping locations in the novels that we were reading. This is built using Google My Maps. I'm very much, when I do student projects, I, I always ensure that I have student consent for them to be made public. I did not have 100% consent from students to make this public. That's why I'm showing you a screenshot. Um, and the link mymaps.google.com is the specific tool from Google that lets you do this. So uh, you can see here that we have the broad geographical span of African diaspora literary production just based on the three times I've taught the class. We could certainly add more to this. Uh, students are able to drop a pin on a particular location. They can add videos. This is um, there's a YouTube video embedded here. They can add images, they can add text. So I was having them do some research on and annotate the location. And what was really interesting to see when after several rounds of students uh, for several courses had worked on the project was to see, uh, this is London, for example, we were seeing the clustering of uh, literary production around notable immigrant neighborhoods in London or, or um, areas like South Hall, which actually a fair amount of, interestingly enough, South Asian immigrants, um, but that led students to learn about how um, at one point in British history before multiculturalism tried to divide and conquer uh, the Black and Asian people in the UK, um, there was solidarity. Um, in around British um, Black Power, the British Black Panther movement, um, and then in Brixton as well, another um, an, uh, area of London that has a sizable Caribbean immigrant population. So being able to map these locations then led students into doing research about the place and then using that research in turn to inform their literary interpretation. So it's just this wonderful, um, kind of project that's interdisciplinary and not only are they learning about uh, new places, learning about the histories of place and the histories of immigration, but then also in turn looping that knowledge back into their literary interpretation. And so it's been a really wonderful project. So as I've suggested today, Digital humanities, particularly when we are teaching from the digital Black Atlantic, gives students opportunities to understand the power dynamics that shape digital knowledge production. So we can ask them to read about these politics of knowledge and examine projects that other people have done um, so that they can start to understand that there are these gaps and omissions, both in print culture and increasingly in digital culture. And equally as important is integrating digital humanities into our teaching and giving students the opportunity to intervene in those power dynamics and to improve representation for the Black diaspora in the digital cultural record through creating projects. It's crucial that our students understand that they don't just have to be consumers of digital media or consumers of digital knowledge, but they can actually have the power to control the means of the production of knowledge and be really active agents in that regard. By bringing together digital humanities um, and the study of the African diaspora in our teaching, we can show them how. And together we can more fully realize the democratization of knowledge that digital humanities promises. Thank you for your attention today. And I'm really looking forward to the discussion. Oh gosh, thank you so much. Rupika, that was wonderful. I really appreciate your presentation. It was clear, it was fluid, and it gave us so much to think about. Um, and I really hope that many of us are able to take what you have said here and bring it into practice in our 
classrooms, both real and virtual. So thank you so much for a fantastic presentation. I have um, a question that I'd like to start off with. And of course, I'd like to invite anyone that is viewing on YouTube to feel free to leave a question in the chat and we'll definitely take it up and pose that question to Professor Sam. So please do share any questions that you have. So I suppose I want to take up what you just said towards the end of your presentation, where you were really encouraging us to think about classrooms and think about what we can do um, with regard to the digital humanities and how we can bring them into our classrooms in easier ways than, than we might have anticipated. Now, I'm thinking about perhaps how to build interest in the cultural heritage data here in Jamaica, given that there's an ownership anxiety in our country and region and more broadly in the African diaspora, right? So who owns this culture? Who can own this culture? Who can benefit from owning this culture um, versus making it public, available, um, and perhaps open access. So can you perhaps talk to us about how to allay fears that participants may have about digitizing cultural artifacts? Absolutely, and thank you for such a wonderful question. I wanna clarify, I know that I was sort of evangelizing for openness and access and everything should be free. Uh, and actually, I want to stipulate, and particularly if, if you end up reading New Digital Worlds, it's actually more nuanced than that, right? It's actually um, this idea that information just wants to be free is very much an idea that comes out of Anglo-American and Western, Western European culture um, in the US and Canada, the UK, Western Europe. And what's often presented to us is that you know this is the new approach to knowledge and if you want to get on board for the future get on board with this approach to knowledge but the reality is is that is one protocol for thinking about knowledge as one culturally embedded and inflected idea i think for example to indigenous approaches to cultural heritage, where within a community, say within a, na a Native nation in the U.S., there may be some pieces of information, some kinds of information that are fine for anybody to see, but then there are some that only people within uh, a community should be able to see. And then there's things that only an elder should be able to see. Um, and one of the really interesting things about the tools that we have to work with is often these free and openly available tools we have to work with were built with the idea that either something is private or something is public. They're not usually built with the idea that there are cultural protocols that might shape why certain kinds of knowledge should be openly available and others shouldn't. So there's a really wonderful tool uh, for creating a managing material in digitized archives. It's called Makurtu. And it was built with the Wurrumungu community, um, an indigenous community in, in Australia. And it explicitly allows for building in different kinds of levels of access for a community. And I think that's really what we need to be thinking about. The ownership of those decisions needs to be with the community uh, that you know, has sovereignty over that material. Uh, I'm thinking here, for example, going back again to indigenous studies, indigenous data sovereignty is a really wonderful idea and has been put into practice um, that sort of says that all the decision-making over access and control and collection of data and knowledge about a community belongs to that community. So it's very much about building those community relationships and allowing the communities to be the people who are driving and participating in the conversations about making things open. I think it's important for us to remember, it's not just open or not, there are gradations. So I showed you, for example, the cultural atmos of global blackness. It's not an openly available to everybody, but I have permission to use it with my classes and I have permission to use it with my students. I can show a screenshot here. 
Um, it has value. It's important without having to be openly available to everyone because the community that created it decided that is not what they wanted. So I think it's building those connections and building those relationships uh, is how we make those decisions. Absolutely. Okay, thank you so much for that thoughtful answer. Um, I just want you to know, of course, that Shyler is free, is watching, and she thanks you. <laughs> she thanks you for your presentation. Now, I have a question from Tunde Bawaji, and the question is on coming up through YouTube, and it says, does Digital Black Atlantic further consolidate the miniaturization of Africa in all important respects relative to the other three continents, the Americas, Eurasia, Africa, and Australia. So does it further consolidate the miniaturization of Africa? I will say that we make it very clear that even though we were aiming for a broader geographical representation in the volume, um, because we are two academics who work in the US, it was very heavily US centric. And we it wasn't exclusively US centric, but certainly it was pretty broad. You know, I think that, you know, because we take effort specifically to show the variety of digital humanities approaches that are taking place in countries in Africa, we're trying to push back against that. I think though that there's really wonderful work that's going on in African digital humanities. There is a lot of work that's going on in Nigeria. There's a lot of work that's going on in South Africa. And then certainly um, the South, uh, the Southern Africa digital humanities organization as well has been working regionally. And I think it's, it's we need a both and. If we need ways to think through diasporic connections, uh, we also need a way to ensure that the scholarship that's happening uh, in countries in Africa, uh, and, and as they're happening very specifically in their unique locations, um, is also part of the conversation. So for example, there's a wonderful volume that's currently being edited specifically on African digital humanities. And we need those approaches too, because there's a value to thinking transnationally, but we also don't want a transnational conversation to take the place of the local conversations like what we're doing in the US around Black DH or what's happening with Caribbean digital or what's happening with African digital humanities. Thank you so much. And I do hope that you'll be able to share um, with us some links so that we can share them to all of the viewers and we'll make that all available to everyone so that you can incorporate some of these tools into your classroom. Um, or if you're a student watching, you can encourage your teacher, if you're in high school or your professor to build it into the curriculum. So we'll definitely be offering those tools. Now I have another question and this is a question I think that stems from um, the reading of Digital Black Atlantic. And that question is about um, digital repatriation. Uh, so can you talk a bit about the ways that DH opens up the space for digital repatriation? That's a really wonderful question. So I really in concept love the idea of digital repatriation and the idea that you know we can create digital surrogates and um, sort of almost try and and piece back together the fragmented nature of cultural heritage that comes from so much of it having been stolen by people in europe and displayed in museums I think that it's important not to allow digital repatriation to become an excuse for Europeans to not actually return their stolen cultural heritage. I think that's really important. And it's actually been nice to see, for example, with the, some of the return of the Benin bronzes, that there are moves towards material repatriation. Um, you know, I think that what's very interesting, I think, for example, to in Atlanta, Georgia, where I used to live in the airport between I believe it's terminal A and B are these amazing, beautiful Shauna statues um, from Zimbabwe. And they're being I mean, they're humongous. They're beautiful. I just I walk, you know, I'll walk that stretch just to get to see them. And they were um, they were sent to for display for an exhibition and then they never left. And part of the reason they never left is because 
the state of Georgia told Zimbabwe, you need to pay for shipping back. And I mean, these are, I mean, these are, you must be hundreds of pounds you know, of, of, of sculpture. <laughs> it's really ridiculous. And, you know, then the argument became, you know, well, we're, we're really in a better position to take care of these. And that's often used as the example, that's used as the excuse for why repatriation doesn't happen. Well, we have the curate curators and we have the right technologies. And so it's really important that that not become a way of, um, of, of making an excuse for continuing um, theft. And then the sort of digital theft piece of it is that, you know, if we're thinking about digital repatriation, this can't be something that's done in a vacuum by people in a museum in the US or a museum in Berlin or London without input and communication and relationships with you know, the people whose, whose material was dispossessed. And so again, I mean, indigenous data sovereignty has been a wonderful model and example for dealing with this. Um, because if we're thinking about digital repatriation again, under the tenets of indigenous data sovereignty, you actually have to work with the indigenous community whose cultural heritage was dispossessed. You work with them on creating the metadata on the protocols around the sharing and dissemination and you know, standardization of the actual um, digital surrogates that are created. So it's a, I think there's a lot of promise if done right, but also we have to continue holding the people who stole um, our cultural heritage uh, accountable. And I say our as a Kashmiri person. Um, so South Asia has, has dealt with that as well. Right. Wow. Um, thank you. Um, let's maybe think about the decolonial classroom um, and how maybe digital humanities creates that space for decolonizing the space of the classroom so that it's not a hierarchy, not a vertical hierarchy or anything, but that we have this kind of evenness where everyone can bring something to the table or to the computer. Can you talk about that a bit? Yeah, I mean, this concept of decolonizing the classroom is one that I have many feelings about because you know, I think a lot of the movement for this uh, the, or rather, I would say not the movement so much as the popularization of decolonizing the classroom came out of efforts in, in the UK and saying, we're going to diversify our curriculum. When you come to a country like the US and you start talking about decolonizing the curriculum, it ends up meaning something different because the US is a settler colonial state who is continuing to colonize native people. And so, you know, when I think about it in the context of the US, it actually, I, I get really upset about it because, you know, unless we're really talking about land and we're talking about um, trying to undo the uh, dispossession in which our universities continue to participate, uh, then we're not doing any kind of decolonizing of the classroom. I think there've been really good critiques of its limitations in the UK as well. And so I think it's very contextual, um, depending on what is the history of colonization in a particular location. And I imagine for, for Jamaica has some similarities to say India, where the English education system was such a clear part of the colonial project that it is actually more like the British case where we're trying to think about representation and control over knowledge. We're trying to think about, you know, how is this a sort of standardization of the English language erased vernacular um, language? And we're thinking also about you know, that power dynamic model of the classroom, the very top down hierarchical model of the, the well, Paula Freire would call it the banking model where you have the instructor who has all the knowledge and makes the deposits of knowledge into their students. And so, I mean, I very much think that if we are going to actually engage our students, um, particularly you know, engage them to be producers of knowledge and to take control over the ability to create content, which will be valuable for them in their jobs, but also just valuable for them as, as people. Um, there's, a, there's a lot that digital humanities can do there. And that's why I love it. That's why I love teaching with it because 
especially my students, you know, I work at, as I've said previously, I work at an under-resourced public university. Most of my, I would say 60%, I believe is the number of our students are the first in their families to go to college. Um, we have students from middle class to predominantly working class backgrounds. And they don't often come having felt empowered by the education they've had so far. They're been sort of taught, you know, to sort of sit there and be quiet. And that's good behavior in a classroom or participate only when, you know, you raise your hand and somebody calls on you. Um, they're not really encouraged to be that you can be a producer of knowledge and not just a consumer. And so I've just loved the digital humanities projects that get them even something as simple as say, there's a tool called Voyant and it's a textual analysis tool. And you really copy and paste a piece of text and it, it gives you very basically it'll give you a word cloud that shows you what words are most frequent in that text but then it does other more complicated things but just getting them to be actively and hands-on engaged in a method for for thinking and allowing them to use that to think through for example the interpretation of a literary text it really engages them in their thinking and learning in a way that they often haven't experienced in their primary and secondary education. So that's really crucial. Oh, that sounds really helpful. Um, I'm just wondering if you could maybe say what devices are best. Um, when you talked about the various platforms and even mentioning this last one, Voyant, can students access some of these um, these apps, some of the software using as little as a phone or does a, is a laptop necessary? What would you say? Yeah, I mean, pretty much I'm trying to think. So Tableau is the only thing I mentioned that would require, uh, require an actual laptop. Everything else that I mentioned can be done on a phone. And that's something we think about a lot here because we, we actually have students, we have students who are taking entire online classes on their phone. Um, they're not, they don't have laptops. And so that is something we very much um, think about in the decisions that, that we are making around the tools that we are using. Um, you know, the really wonderful thing about, you know, working with data and working in the context of a Google Sheet is that all the students can put a Google, you know, Sheets app on their phone and they can enter data. Um, it's not ideal because it's harder to see, um, but that's what they're using. And so I'm very much of the mindset of focus on the kinds of tools that meet them where they are in terms of what technologies they have access to and using and using those. In terms of what's the best, I very much think of that as a function of what are, what kind of research questions are you looking to inspire in the students? I will say students love to make math. I don't know what it is about maps, but they just love maps. And so I end up doing a lot of map work because they just want to put things on maps and they want to learn about how you know, this map that you think is you know, eternal and objective is actually a social construct. And so I do, I do love mapping and it's, it's definitely probably like using a Google My Map for a mapping project is probably as easy as it gets in yeah. terms of both the, the, the actual technology, but also that they come with a native understanding of what a map is that you can mess around with. Whereas with textual analysis, you sort of teach them kind of what is textual analysis first, which isn't hard, but you know, that's a great low, I call it the low hanging fruit. <laughs> okay, okay, that's good. I'll keep that one in mind, right? Maps, <laughs> they make it everything easier, make everything easier. So there is another question that came on YouTube and that question is from Deborah Ferdinand James, and she asks, can you elaborate on the complexity of intersectionality in Black Atlantic digital humanities? Absolutely. So we have a, I ended up cutting it out because I didn't want to talk for too long, but we very much address, you know, the critiques of Gilroy, particularly in the ways that he's very Anglo-centric and then pretty much ignores women. And so, you know, I have, some of my work is actually focused on intersectionality in digital humanities. I'm the editor, co-editor of a volume titled Intersectionality in Digital Humanities. I have an article 
and digital humanities quarterly on the topic um, and really on you know I think of it primarily through data which is that when we're working with data it's a really interesting and important opportunity to think about how do we design a data set in a way that brings out the intersectional dimensions of a data set so when we're working on the pan-africanism data project we're thinking all about people where they're located what their employment is, where, where you know, what kind of job they have or what kind of work they do. And um, we were also looking with that project about what kind of representations of women are we seeing, um, just for example, in that data. And, you know, it was really funny because we, you know, we did, we were struggling because we didn't want, so many of the people are just unknown figures so we didn't want to get into gender guessing by name and so but what we were making notes in our, our notes column for example like um amy jacques garvey was hugely hugely involved in many of these events for example so you know we were making notes about who the women who were seeing me recurring um and and so you know i like to think about it how do we pull those dimensions out of out of, of the data um, you know, what's often really interesting about digital humanities, as I think I was alluding to in my talk, was that unless we're actively thinking about how are we resisting the dominance of whiteness, the dominance of men, the dominance of white men, how are we actively thinking about bringing, for example, Black women's voices to light, unless we're actively doing that, it's not going to happen. So I have another project. Clearly, I have lots of time on my hands <laughs> but uh, I, uh, I have a project called reanimate which is an intersectional feminist publishing collective and we released our first volume in february and it is a called black, freddie washington a black feminist reader and it's a it's a digital edition that's open access of the writing of freddie washington who was an actress um, in the 1930s who wrote some really wonderful newspaper columns in the 1940s on race and culture and war and so, you know, this is an example where we wanted to do a volume on Freddie Washington and a publisher said, well, there's no market for it because nobody's ever heard of her. And then we said, but nobody's ever going to hear about her if there isn't a publication of our work. And so we're caught in this endless loop. And so, you know, we decided, no, we're just going to do it ourselves and we're going to do this with writing by by women of color in media industries. And so we did. And so that these are the places where we have to really be attuned to not just relying on what's already digitized and what's already available, because that's how these canonical biases, this white bias, all male bias, all get reproduced. So if you don't build it, it will never happen, right? We have to do the work. And I think you're really making that abundantly clear here. Um, I don't see any more questions on YouTube, but it could be because someone is being um, resistant hesitant to type so go ahead and put in another question and if i see it in the next couple of seconds i'll be able to to ask that question um i think i want to ask a question and maybe this will be my final one um that's maybe taking up perhaps the darker side of digital humanities um and thinking about security so thinking i mean you're you're saying here of course that students love the mapping they find it to be particularly fun um not sure what exactly is motivating their their desire to, to make maps but can you talk a bit about how those maps come to be right um the security element of it all who owns the maps when we make these maps who else can access them and what to kind of keep in mind as we build something like a map yeah absolutely you know one of the questions i ask the most is you know how do we deal with the fact that you know you rely on tools that are owned by basically evil corporations and i don't have an answer for that you know my answer is well that's what's accessible and available to my students and so you know i actually think you know if we go down the road of you know x is owned by evil corporation then we sort of get to the point where we can't actually do anything we'll have nothing everything is pretty much owned by like five evil corporations so <laughs> i mean it's really what you do with it right mm -hmm. but in terms of access and security so my approach is you know when there's a decision to be made about a platform i involve the students in the decisions about the platform so for example my preference for the cultural atlas of global backness would not have been a google my map i will just say 
that was the student's preference. And so I said, okay, because, you know, I don't have any, I'm not precious about what we're going to use. I'm really concerned about what you're going to learn. And if that's what you want to do, fine, we will use that. And so, um, you know, then we had to think about, you know, access and availability. I felt like if something was going to be public, then all of my students needed to consent to it being public. And that if, uh, no, if there's one person who said, no, it can't be public, then it can't be public. I think that's really, really important. You know, I think that other important piece is that when you're relying on a third party platform, you have to always think about the fact that the third party platform may decide to stop supporting the tool that you are using. And that's real. And it's happened to people. I'm trying to think if it's happened to me. This has happened to me. I mean, I was using a tool called Storify for teaching students how to create essays out of found pieces of social media, and then it disappeared. And so I had to find a replacement. But when you're investing in a longer term project, then what's really important is to think about how you are keeping your data in a way that you can use it in another tool. So that's, for example, with we will say with reviews in digital humanities, all of our data we also have in you know flat files that if we had to stop relying on PubPub from MIT's Knowledge Futures Group, which is the platform that we use, you know, it'd take probably maybe a couple of days, but we could get everything up somewhere else. And so that's the piece of preservation and sustainability that. I really emphasize if you have it in a format, like a plain text format that is going to be reusable in another way, you know, as a .txt file, if it's text, .csv file, if it's a data set, .json file, also another kind of data, you will always be able to use it somewhere else. Um, so those are some of the, the questions that I've thought about. Um, the other piece of it is also students and whether if they're their names are used. So I feel very strongly about I want to credit students for work on projects that they're collaborators on, but sometimes for reasons of their own safety and well being, they don't want to put their names on the internet, they don't want people to find them, or, you know, they just don't want in 20 years to be associated with something they did when they were you know, 22. Understandable. I'm sort of glad there wasn't that much internet when I was 22. And so you know, I fully very much put respecting their wishes and their desires at the forefront of this. I've had students use pseudonyms. I've had students just not put their names on things um, if they're willing to have it public but don't want to be named. Well, I guess we'll end it there on those points about privacy and security, because I think they're really critical, really important. And also, I think it's it kind of went full circle with the Q&A with regard to ownership, right? So as long as you keep those files in a flat um, format, then you can migrate your materials to different platforms as needed and maintain that ownership and never lose it. Because that's the goal of the digital humanities is to preserve for um, evermore or I think forevermore, that sounds good. So I'll stop here, but I thank you so much for entertaining me with the answers to those questions and for a fantastic presentation. And I'm gonna hand it over now to Deputy Dean Stanley Griffin to close out. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Isis. Thank you, Prof. Um, this, Thank you very much for this very thought provoking and intriguing um, lecture. I really want to um, thank the following persons who made our time together possible. Professor Rupika Rissam. I keep, you know, your th very thought provoking and your very interdisciplinary presentation gave us lots of ideas. Um, for me as an archivist and archival educator, you've highlighted many of the concerns that we think about with the digital age and how we operationalize that in our courses. And so you've made the digital humanities very tangible, possible project oriented. And we really hope we really uh, will use your ideas. I will be watching this lecture sometime again and again as we as we formalize our own digital humanities programs. So thanks again. I want to also thank our Dean um, folks in the department of my notes, not scrolling, 
Voting in the Department of the Faculty Office, Ms. Sophia Hills Johnson, um, Dr. Aisha Spencer, Dr. Aisha Samaj Hall, and the Departments of Department of Literatures in English, the Deputy Dean for Marketing and Outreach, Dr. Nicole Plummer, the technical team from the Mona IT Services, and finally, each of you for gracing us with your interest, your time, and your participation this afternoon. So thanks for joining us on our seventh faculty lecture. Thank you, Professor Rissam, for your effort, your energy, and your, your, your experiences. And that is going to be very useful to us going forward. So folks, have a good afternoon, and thanks again for joining us. Bless. <laughs>